Tom wanted to lose himself. Lying on the hood of his car under the night sky, the thin glow of his cigarette winked at streetlights. The odd passing plane with its cloud penetrating taillight and the boundless stretch of stars above. The crimson halo blew sparks into the night which, like humble offerings before a devouring god, were snapped into oblivion within seconds. His problems were many, but probably less than all the heavenly bodies in the sky. The faint sounds of Bon Jovi and Bruce Springsteen danced around the car's interior, as a result of Tom's working stiff playlist being set on repeat. As the young man tried to focus on the moon's craters, he felt a tinge of comfort that working a dead-end job was not known only to him, and he felt a tinge of sadness that his travails were not all that unique or interesting. But as he lay atop his 87 Dodge Daytona, he did not want to lose himself because of these problems. He wanted to immolate himself with knowledge and burning creativity. He wanted to submerge himself into the dark expanse and its blanket of light. He berated himself for not knowing enough about the stars and planets, the moons and asteroids. His star sign was the crab, and in a hit of emotion, he cried self-pityingly because he felt that he always moved sideways in life. He needed to bolster his identity, and his eyes searched frantically for the crab's figure amongst the different points of light in the night sky. And though he was hungry for self-discovery, for the next few minutes he was not himself. He was someone else. He was somewhere else. And he spoke in tongues of inverted constellations. A pale blue dot. It exists at the back of our minds. But once in a yellow moon, the murmurs whirl and idle talk begins to turn to our night sky and we remember it. Half our planet is in permanent darkness and on the border of this eternal day and night we have temples to our great god who sprung from the hiss and steam of fire meeting water. Upon his death, his giant blood created our rivers, his bones our mountains, his saliva our atmosphere, and black-clad dwarves ceremoniously held his ponderous eyelids open for a year so that he could dissolve his wisdom and experience into the ether with its waves of light and its starry firmament. When we squirrel ourselves over to the dark side, it is to witness rare eclipses. With some luck, folds of gas part like curtains in a great unveiling. If nothing else, we just feel it. And yes, sometimes that pale blue dot is visible and we see where those radio signals have come from, the ones that give snippets of insight into a world beyond the celestial horizon. Through gargle transmissions sent out to die, we have a quixotic sequence of popular music, tinny entreaties to the masses, sober reports of great massacres and weather reports so bleakly focused on their planet's limits. Extraordinarily narrow-minded, they plan their lives without worrying about solar flares or plasmatic wind. We chuckle at their mention of Orion's belt and Ursa Minor. Where they see crabs, we see glucose, and their line is our heartbeat of the other worlds. We long for the day when we can meet them and correct this bastard, orphaned autography. Tom was making it all up as he went along. But in this union of creative flow and the stars above, he started to feel better. Through the lens of our great scopes, light is inhaled and images carried as particles simmer and shimmer and percolate in their transmission along the instruments all the way to our brains. We see their continents, their oceans and wisps of white that lean and fall across the face of their planet. There is the Horn of Africa. We know this is what they call it, but is it truly a horn? Does the wind blow through it? Do the storms stop there and pay their toll? It looks, depending on your mood, like a shell deposited on the shoreline of a rugged continent, a gift from the perpetual sea. Those of a violent disposition or temperament would say that the land and the water were at war for control of this jagged, 
jutting out headland, one which stands guard over a narrow ribbon of water. He paused for a moment, blocked. Then inspiration found him again. His flow was being informed by snatches of documentaries about exoplanets and his own imagination. The crooked horn at Smile's Edge, a portion of a face, eyes unseen, beams at the universe. As I travel there in my mind's eye, I am accosted by tiny people. It's only when I pause deliberately and I'm aware of my surroundings do I hear the throng of many voices bounce around the air. From my planet these people are small, invisible, and in my imagination, I lack the mathematical sophistication to make them big as I bridge this yawning chasm between our two worlds. The limp cigarette in Tom's mouth was lit again, and the narrator became human once more. There's more to say, but not everything needed saying at once. The Italian boot could be the footprint of a long extinct race of giants that fought the gods and lost. The Japanese islands were the tracks of a spurned lover's tears. The Himalayan mountains were the star sign of some far off race. It meant they were creative but capricious. He traced new constellations with his finger and swore. It was a curse word born out of a sweet realization. Now he could see new things in the night sky and he understood that he controlled his destiny. The future belongs not to the faint-hearted but to the brave. Tom's revelation was unfurling through emotion and half-remembered lines. It made him desirous of slipping these surly bonds of earth, to chase shouting winds, to touch the face of God, to live by the stars and to die by them, to be when all said and done, to be buried in them. His ecstasy was growing. Increasingly, he understood that he was a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the planets. Suddenly, Tom realized that one gleaming light was actually a tech billionaire satellite. Though he had forgotten about it, the original reason for driving to this spot was to see it. The media had been making a song and dance about it. How would the fact that the satellite would be visible from Earth? For a moment, Tom wanted to be it, but man and celestial, and he stood watching the object as it weaved a sure and lonely arc across his field of vision and out of view. Tom was about ready to leave, but he had one thing left to do. Although he had improvised the character of the unknown narrator from an unknown world, he felt compelled to flesh it out one more time. Leaving this spot and this particular emotional state of disassociation would feel more real if he could do it just one more time and say goodbye, good luck, see you later, as someone or something else. They say another eclipse is coming. The gaseous spirits will make way for the crossing of two heavenly bodies, as if looking coyly away from a union that begets planets and stars, the two dogs of illumination will be covered. That pale blue dot will perhaps slip into our view again, like a pulsating mirage at the halfway point of a circle we can only guess is there. Their planet with the heat of a multitude of souls, its blue and green reality, its intermittent crackles of radio. Light stretches and contracts, it flickers, it breathes, speaking into the great dark void we all share. And I will hold this bluish, speck in my gaze for as long as it is there, delicately suspended. After expressing this final thought, he rolled up his window. It had been a curious if not untypical night, one that had stretched into the next day, but one that was simply an extended collection of loose moments and ideas rather than a long night of one fixed, meaningful thing. He was out of smokes and tired, so he drove home. The street lights and stars guided it away, and they bounced off the exterior of his beat-up 87 Dodge Daytona, adding a slice of luster and prestige to the only vehicle left on the road. Tom kept glancing at the night sky, and he made a promise to himself to never stop looking at it. For the rest of his life, he would become a disciple of all the things that lived up there. <laughs>